to the June 14th, 2021 Tualatin City Council work session. Uh, we have two items on the agenda tonight, a Tualatin moving forward quarterly report, and then our council meeting agenda review communications and roundtable. So let's hand it off to, I'm assuming, Jeff and Megan for the quarterly report for Tualatin moving forward. All right, good evening. Um, so I, Megan's going to be most of the talking tonight, but um, I couldn't let a council meeting and a quarterly report go by without saying something. Uh, so every time we talk about this uh, program, it's super fun, super exciting. Um, I will say the public outreach piece is one of my favorite pieces because it it just feels like it's going so well with the community and we're like interacting with people. And uh, so it's awesome. Um, so I did have a couple of things to report that are not in the PowerPoint real quick. Um, so on June 28th, so in almost exactly two weeks, Garden Corner Curves, we're going to close the road out there. Uh, so we just wanted to give everybody a heads up. Um, that's to allow the contractor to come in and uh, take out that culvert and replace it with what's called a box culvert, which looks like a little bridge. Um, and that's probably going to be closed. We're, we're saying right now into October. Um, and so uh, there's a bunch of work that goes along with moving that culvert out of the way, including some PGE work and some gas line work and some utility work and just a lot of stuff. So, uh, so you'll start seeing um, some public information uh, going out that might have already gone out, uh, Megan. Yeah. So that's that's coming up. And then um, on consent agenda tonight is uh, a big project. So Martin Azzi Sager. So that's the uh, the signal to sort of replace our Keystone Cop intersection and make that function um, way better. So that's super exciting. And I will also just uh, report that the bids came in really close to the engineer's estimate. Uh, so we were really, really happy. You never know when you bid a project how, uh, how volatile the market's going to be. And, uh, so to not jinx the rest of the program, I won't say much more, but I will say on this one, we were very happy uh, with the bids. Yeah. So, um, and with that, oh, and one last thing, 11, we're going to be doing 11 construction projects this summer. So you're going to see construction all over town. So that's super cool. So, and then I will hand it off to Megan. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. So um, as with previous quarterly updates, tonight's presentation will highlight recent developments on a few projects and some program components. Um, unlike in previous updates, we're providing a closer look at our community engagement efforts and strategies this year. Um, one of the capstone pieces of that, of course, is our neighborhood traffic safety program, which is currently in its solicitation period. So I'll include a quick update on that. And then two reminders for you all. One, of course, is that our fourth annual report will be coming out this fall slash winter. I'm, I'm, it doesn't feel correct, but I'm pretty sure it's the fourth one. Um, and then, of course, you can always find updated information about the bond program and project-specific updates in particular on our website, dwelltomovingforward.com. So community engagement is a fundamental part of the bond program. It's a fundamental part of how the city does business in general. Um, for the bond program, it not only informs the design of projects, but it was also intentionally incorporated into project selection through our neighborhood traffic safety program. It was also a key piece of many of our key projects like the Garden Corner Curves, of course. Um, many of our existing engagement strategies relied on face-to-face -face or in-person engagement. Um, so we were forced to ask ourselves, is public participation in a pandemic possible? Um, and we said that four times really fast, all in a row, and we decided, of course, it's possible. So as Sherilyn's quote says right there, um, we had to experiment, we had to try new things, and we had to be creative. So the bond program responded to the pandemic in much the same way that the city did and other organizations did. We took a couple weeks to pause and take a look at our operations and our safety measures. Um, we reviewed the health recommendations. Uh, and then once we had done all those things, we, we continued, we proceeded. Um, as evident by the number of construction projects that happened last summer, it didn't slow us down much. Um, so in addition to our construction, our public outreach also continued. And one of the reasons why it was able to continue um, was because of our really strong program. Um, so our, our really strong team. So pictured above is a group that we call T3 or our Tualatin Transportation Team. It's a combination of staff and our consultants who work on the bond program. Um, we meet every two weeks and there's a few special guests, which you'll notice in the upper left and right hand corners of the screen. 
Um, so this team works really closely together on all different aspects of the bond program. Um, Alta Planning and Design, which I think you all have heard from before, handles our public outreach for project specifics information. And then we've got Barney and Worth on board that helps with our um, program-wide communication efforts as well. And so through the efforts of this team, we're able, we were able to still move forward throughout the bond program. Um, public engagement, of course, is super dependent on the project and the project's location. Um, so we design each public engagement plan depending on those two factors. Um, there are a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. And we wanna make sure that we capture that in our outreach at techniques. So this is a slide that should look fairly familiar. We've used it in previous presentations. Um, and the reason we keep coming back to it is because it cleanly demonstrates the, all of the different ways that we can conduct public outreach, even in a pandemic. So on the left-hand side, you see all of those different options that we've been doing now over the past year and a half, um, plus a few items that we've done before and we hope to do again someday. We layer our communication approach, often employing multiple strategies because we've got a diverse community and people are reached in different ways. And sometimes it takes two or three pings before somebody is officially reached um, and takes action, whether that's responding to a survey um, or really in informing themselves about a project or submitting a project suggestion online. Um, so we use, we use multiple different strategies for each project for the most part. Um, to the greatest extent possible, we provide our communication materials in both English and Spanish. So you can see in the top left corner that looks like a postcard that was in English. Next to it is what looks like a yard sign in Spanish. Most of our printed materials are two-sided, one in English and one in Spanish. Um, and this is really important because we've got a large portion of our community that's bilingual or Spanish speaking only. And we wanna make sure that the program is just as accessible for them as it is for English speaking communities. Um, so this next slide includes a list of some of the things that we either did for the first time this year or we did a little bit differently. So I'll touch on a few of those. So one, um, which is a prominent one, is we've taken advice from the Tua Latinos, the formerly known as the Diversity Task Force. So on a number of occasions over the past year, we've met with them about a specific project and said, here's basically what the project is. Here's what we're looking to do. This is the type of information we're looking for from the community. What do you recommend? How can we reach out to people who live around this area or your neighbors or the folks down the street? Um, they provided us advice and then we incorporated that ice into our public outreach plan for those projects. Um, so that's been a really crucial avenue for us to conduct engagement in ways that we haven't, haven't done before. Um, we also used gift cards to incentivize um, survey responses. So we used both 25 gift cards to Fred Meyer and $100 gift cards to Fred Meyer. Um, this is probably not a surprise, but as it turns out, um, incentives are uh, tangible incentives are motivating for folks. Um, crosswalks are great, but Fred Meyer gift cards can sometimes be even more appetizing. So um, those are really successful at driving out turn up. Now uh, you've seen our yard signs throughout the entire bond program announcing that there's a project near you We've also used them to encourage participation in surveys and ask people to submit a project suggestion online and provide other types of specific information. I mean, you've probably also seen our social media posts. Um, I hesitate to say this, but Nextdoor has actually been really helpful. Um, one of the great pieces of Nextdoor is that you can provide a message tailored to the specific neighborhood rather than blasting it to the whole community, um, which has been great as we're looking for specific feedback. We've also used text messages, um, both to provide updates on projects to individuals who have reached out with questions, to remind people that there's a meeting coming up that they might want to attend, and um, to provide survey responses. And I've got a slide a little bit later that I'll talk more about that, as well as the sidewalk sticker survey. Um, a lot of those techniques rely on people having an existing connection to the project or to us, whether that's following our social media pages or walking by the location that the project happens to be. Um, one of the ways that we've kind of in increased participation with folks that maybe didn't happen upon one of those other ways is by sending out postcards and letters. Uh, so this slide right here is intended to show you the vast amount of postcards and letters that we've sent out this past year. So we send out mailings to tell people that there's a project near you going to construction. We send out postcards or surveys or uh, mailings to tell people that there's a survey coming up. Um, we send general information via mail. This has been a way to make sure that we at least get it into your inbox, whether or not you throw it away immediately as I do with some of the mail I receive, or you maybe glance at the first couple sentences, but throw it away after that point, or maybe you read it all the way through, which I'm sure all of you do. So anyways, this has been an effective way to reach out to a lot of people. 
Uh, so I think you're all familiar, or most of you are familiar with our community engagement coordinator, Betsy Rodriguez Roof, who's pictured there. Um, she's up on the agenda a little bit later this evening, so I won't give away too much or spoil any of her talking points, but I do want to acknowledge the work that she's done on the program, particularly with our outreach to our Spanish speaking community. Um, so you can see her quote, she references the Tua Latinos group, which we've met with multiple times, the most recent of which was, of course, a couple of weeks ago, um, but this has been a really important component of our program. And Betsy's work there has been amazing. So a lot of the ways that we've been able to engage this past year have been high tech. We've used surveys, we've used Zoom calls, that type of thing. But throughout that, we've also wanted to make sure that we had a personal touch or a personal connection with people as well. Um, so I've got two examples on the slide there. The one on the left is for our 95th and Avery project. We had some specific questions about 93rd. I think if I recall correctly, it had to do with parking. And we wanted to find out from folks who lived in apartments around that area, as well as people who lived directly on that street. So we were able to use really specific outreach um, using a survey to get feedback on that area. So I think we had flyers, we put on windshields, we had um, yard signs, we had postcards mailed to the apartments. And through that outreach, we were able to get 148 respondents who ranked different solutions for that project, which ultimately we're pretty confident that they were from that area because our outreach was so specific. Um, so that was a big one for us. The other example on the slide is a screenshot from a recent Tua Latinos meeting where they were talking about the neighborhood traffic safety program. So you can see Betsy in the top center and then Adrian from Alta Planning and Design also in the top center. Um, so in addition to meeting with the Tua Latinos via virtual meetings, we've also spent time talking to parent teacher organization groups about various projects. We've met with the CIOs of, on a number of occasions. And we've also held our own informational sessions or open houses for a variety of projects to share information with the community. Um, so one of our goals in our public outreach has been to build relationships or to build on relationships. And so maintaining this personal touch, even though we're using a lot of technology, has been crucial to our, our communication strategy. All right, so this is one that I mentioned earlier on a slide. It's one of my favorites. Um, so this is our 65th Avenue near Meridian Park Hospital. Um, so this project, for those who are familiar with the area, it's building a crosswalk that'll connect some apartments and a bus stop with a hospital across the street. If you've walked down there, um, it's quite loud. There's a lot of cars. The sidewalk's a little narrow. So this sidewalk is going to provide, or excuse me, this crosswalk is going to provide some much needed access. Um, you can see Uma, Jeff, and Mike in descending order or ascending order there on the screen. Um, and we did two things with this project. So the first, we used an online interactive map to find out where potential crossing locations could be. So people were able to log on and I believe they dropped a pin on the map where they thought a crosswalk might be a good fit. And they commented on those and provided other feedback. Through that survey, we were able to narrow it down to two possible locations. And then as you can see pictured here, we used a different technique to figure out whether option A or option B would be preferable. So the two options were fairly close together. And so it was important to us to make sure that people knew exactly what we were talking about. And so we used the stickers, which are, they're literally stickers that you put on the sidewalk. They last for about two to three weeks to indicate this is exactly where the crosswalk would go if you pick option A. This is exactly where the crosswalk would go if you pick option B. Um, we also used a text survey format so people could respond right there from their phone as opposed to needing to jotting down the web address or using their smartphone to respond to it right there. And so that was able to help us figure out whether we wanted to go with option A or B. All right, so one of the great things about surveys in whatever format they are is that you have the ability to ask really simple questions like do you want option A or do you want option B, but also more sophisticated and complicated questions. Um, so a couple of the surveys highlighted here had a little bit more complicated feedback. Um, so Boone's Ferry Road Sidewalks and Bike Lane Corridor Project is a project that happens over a corridor and there's a lot of different project elements to it. And we wanted feedback on all of those project elements. And so we were able to effectively gather that feedback through the survey. Um, also, there was a large number of people who responded. So it provides an opportunity. opportunity to get a lot of input from all. So we've used surveys throughout the entire. All right, I'm getting close to the end here. So um, at our last quarterly update, we talked about the neighborhood traffic safety program. We are now in month three of three of our solicitation period. Suggestions are due by June 30th. 
Um, last year through our outreach, we gathered a ton of different suggestions, many of which are still viable projects. And so you can see the slide indicates that we've got about 50 that we'll roll over and consider this next year. Um, at an upcoming presentation, I'm sure the, the bond team will be here to talk about the different suggestions that came in this year and how we might approach um, deciding which projects go to construction next summer. Of course, the projects that you reviewed last summer are getting ready to get started this summer. I think we've got five or six. And um, I know we've included this in every single presentation we've had. It's really easy. All you have to do is log onto our website and click the green button right in the middle of the screen and submit your project suggestion there. So we encourage you and everybody else to do that by June 30th. With that, I'll stop sharing my screen and Jeff and I are available for questions. Questions for Megan or Jeff? Valerie. No question, but great job on the public outreach. I love to see all the, um, that we're really getting input from our community. It's great. Other questions, comments? Council Brooks. Hey, Councilor Pratt. I just want to give a shout out. I think um, <clears throat> it's kind of almost a magic trick during COVID to be able to reach out to our community and the way that um, there's been so many efforts and um, trying very hard not to leave people out, especially our Spanish speaking residents is really impressive. And um, I know that as we open up, one of the things that will always stay ever important to our residents is our transportation plans and how we're doing on this. And so it's, it's been really nice. And I think it's great too that, um, that even though there's gonna be a lot of projects, it's at least during a time that's been a little quieter on the roads and has a little less impact as we, I know in our community, all wanna keep moving forward. So thanks. Other comments? President Grimes. Hello. Um, yeah, along the lines of Councilor Brooks and Councilor Pratt, um, I just wanted to compliment our staff. Um, they've just done such an outstanding job of not only managing the projects and using the feedback from the community to manage and focus the projects, but to be able to have that kind of community outreach and that kind of success in reaching and getting feedback from the community during such a horrible time. It's just, I've never failed to be impressed. And this particular bond program, the way that it's been managed, I've always said it's sort of like the gold standard for projects. Um, and I just think from beginning to end, it's just fantastic. So um, just my compliments and keep things going. And if there's ever anything that as individual counselors, we can do to help either reach out to communities or constituencies. Um, I'm all about helping and I just compliment you guys for a job well done and thank you. And thank Uma. She's a great, great mascot and figurehead for this. I love it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, the, only, the only thing I have to say, I, I love that idea of the A and B. I thought that was totally ingenious and creative. I saw it on the ground, I drove by there, and I thought it was for people who were map challenged or just happened to be there at the right time, right place, and saw it, it was a great way to get feedback. So kudos to you guys for thinking that up and making it happen, because I've never seen that before. So uh, as Sherilyn mentioned, and Megan mentioned in the very beginning, it was super creative, you were thinking outside the box, and uh, I thank you for that. So anything else? All right. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I see both of you later on. So <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right.